Hello everyone and welcome to a new video brought to you by Lantern Education. My name is Marcus and today we are going to focus on a very specific form of metabolism. So if you're not sure what metabolism is, go back to video one or try to check out the videos that came before this one because today we are going to jump right in and to be fair it's going to be a little complicated. We are going to look at cellular respiration or cell respiration. So that is a very specific form of metabolism and let's jump right in. The first thing that is very important to get right is that cell respiration does not mean breathing, right? When we talk about breathing, taking in air to your lungs, that's what we call ventilation. And we'll get to that when we talk about human physiology. After ventilation, there's gas exchange going on, right? Oxygen is being taken in over the tissue in your lungs and CO2, so carbon dioxide, is released into the air and then into the atmosphere. And so cellular respiration happens after ventilation and gas exchange, and it happens on the cellular level. Every single one of your cells in your body, they're all engaging in cellular respiration. So what does that mean? Here's an important definition. Cellular respiration is the controlled release of energy, energy that is stored in the bonds of organic molecules, like sugar, so glucose. And in the end, that controlled release of energy will be used to form ATP. And if you remember that, we talked about that already. ATP is adenosine triphosphate, and that's sort of the energy currency in the cell. So that's what we use to transfer energy around. There is aerobic cellular respiration, aerobic meaning with air, so we're going to use oxygen. That's the most efficient form, so we get the highest yield of ATP. So per organic molecule we put in, we get the most energy or ATP out of it if we use oxygen. However, there is also anaerobic respiration, so cellular respiration without the use of oxygen in the process. The yield of ATP is smaller here and we will also see why that might still be you know useful or important and under which circumstances so now before we look into aerobic respiration I want to make one sort of connection very clear because later or in another video we're also going to talk about photosynthesis right so that's what plants do and there's a very important connection between these two processes, between cellular respiration and photosynthesis. And we will also notice that because in terms of the chemical processes that are going on, they're very, very similar. What happens is that for photosynthesis, the plants take in CO2 and they take in water. And most importantly, they take in sunlight. So they take in energy stored in sunlight. They use that energy to do what is called carbon fixation. So they take in the CO2 and they turn it from, you know, this gas CO2 into an organic compound like glucose. And in the process, they're actually creating oxygen as well. That's what, you know, we know plants for. And now the connection to cellular respiration is that in cellular respiration, we're going to take the organic compound created by the plant, right? Because in some way, shape or form, we're all eating plants. Even if you eat meat, you know, that animal has eaten plants before. So it's all based on that really. And we're taking in the oxygen that was created by the plants. And in that process, then we are releasing energy stored in the bonds of that organic compound. And we're releasing the CO2 again into the air because we you know, broke apart the organic compound and so in the end it's full circle and that is very important to sort of understand at the beginning before we actually go to the cellular level and look at how that happens so now i want to start by getting to know these sort of actors so the compounds the molecules that are important in the process and i want to start with atp adenosine triphosphate so that is essentially adenine with three phosphate groups. And if we add a phosphate group to any compound, that is called phosphorylation. And phosphorylation makes a compound less stable. And so that means that ATP, which is phosphorylated three times, is readily reactive and can give off the energy that is stored in those bonds very easily. So how does that happen? When we have ATP, we can hydrolyze so that process is called hydrolysis using water to split a molecule apart and we can do that get rid of one of the phosphate groups 
thereby releasing the energy stored in that terminal bond between you know the second and the third phosphate group then we have ADP or adenosine diphosphate and when we want to you know transfer the energy again to that molecule we need to rephosphorylate it and add another phosphate group again Another really important concept here are redox reactions. So this is, again, going to be a lot of chemistry right now. So redox reactions, for those of you who don't know yet, are reduction oxidation reactions. And so these are two very, very important concepts in biochemistry. In the end, what's important to know about this is that it's also a form of transferring energy. And what we're going to look here for is essentially electrons that are being transferred, because that is central to the entire process. And now the redox reactions, it's actually two reactions, and it just depends on which way you're looking at it. So you're always going to have two compounds. And if this compound is being reduced by this compound, this means that this compound is going to gain an electron from this one, and it's going to lose oxygen. We can also look at that in terms of hydrogen, because that's usually what also happens. So it's going to gain an electron or hydrogen, and lose oxygen. Whereas this one is now in the process being oxidized, so that means it is losing an electron or hydrogen and gaining oxygen. And there's actually a really nice mnemonic device here as well. It's called oil rig. So that's like one of these oil platforms out on the ocean, right? And oil rig is short for oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. But here we're talking about electrons, right? That's important. So oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons. And so be very careful when you talk about that, always specify what is being reduced or what is being oxidized. Because if you just say that that's you know, happening, we're, we don't really know who is gaining electrons, who is losing electrons. And that is absolutely central because that's how we transfer energy in the intermediary steps to finally then in the end produce ATP. Obviously now the question is why do we need those redox reactions? Well, as we said before, what that entire process is cell respiration is the slow breakdown of an organic molecule slowly releasing the energy stored in the bonds. In order to do that, we actually need to take these electrons from the organic compound and we need to get them somewhere else to the next step. And the way we do this is by using electron carriers. And so now when we talk about these, you might on paper just see that they're gaining an H and that's the hydrogen. They're also gaining the electrons. They sort of go hand in hand, right? But I always like to focus on the electrons because they'll be important later on. You can imagine electron carriers sort of as like little taxis. They're literally just like picking up the electron, bringing it somewhere else. That's their entire function. And so the two that we're going to focus on is NAD+, which can be reduced to NADH, and FAD, which can be reduced to FADH2. So again, being reduced means they're gaining electrons. And so you can sort of think of it in the way that NAD+, is an unoccupied taxi. Once the electron goes in, it's NADH. It's like putting the little sign on that says, you know, occupied taxi, you can't get in. And FAD is the unoccupied version. Once the electron gets on board, that's going to be FADH2. And again, as a reminder, once that happens, the organic molecule that we're taking the electrons from is losing electrons. So that means it's being oxidized. Exactly. So now we're going to go through that process step by step. And the way we're going to do this is we are actually going to use the notes that I made when I was in the IB. They're a bit messy, but I think it's a good idea to sort of also have like something that you can take as an example for how you might structure your notes. I hope it's understandable and obviously I'll be explaining it along the way. For SL, focus on what's happening at the beginning and the end. For HL, you got to know, you know, all of the different compounds in the intermediary stages as well. We can divide all of that up in four stages. I want to make it clear now. We have glycolysis as our first process. Then we have what's called the link reaction, very small. Then the Krebs cycle. And then finally, the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. Don't be scared by all the fancy names. It's going to be clear how that relates to what we're doing here.